All right, welcome back to our tier one lab series. Today we're gonna to dive into some Active Directory basics. Not just what things are, but what you're actually gonna be doing with Active Directory on the job. I'll show you how to navigate Active Directory, organize things, reset passwords, look at attribute editor and other things. These are the kinds of tickets and concepts that you're gonna be seeing constantly at tier one. In past episodes, we spun up our Windows Server VM, promoted it to a domain controller, and actually got our domain rolling. If you haven't done those and you want to follow along, I highly advise that you go do those first. Okay, so we're back in Azure. I'm going to just go home to where I would be starting if I were you guys. I'm going to find my resource, lab-vm, click connect up here, and I'm going to click connect via Bastion. Here I'm going to put in my username and password that I had already created again in those previous videos. My password, Jake is cool, just kidding. And that's going to log me into my Windows Server instance, and I actually still have this up. In order to get to Active Directory, again, I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And I'm going to click Active Directory here, and Active Directory users and computers might show up. Click on that. This will take us to our Active Directory forest. Again, I have my domain lab.local right here. And this is where I'm going to manage all of my users, groups, devices, distribution groups, things like that. Again, within this domain, I have different OUs, organizational units, that I'm just going to start calling OUs for now on. I have all these basic ones built in, computers, domain controllers, keys, and things like that. I also have the one that I created in the last video, my branch one. This is a branch location that I'm simulating. Within branch one, I right-clicked, I clicked new, and I made some sub-OUs, some organizational units within organizational units. I made the following three. Computers, I made groups, and then I made users. Today I'm not actually gonna do anything with this computers OU because we don't have any computers joined to the domain yet. Computers are a little bit different. In order to make a computer object, we have to actually domain join it and it'll automatically create an object in this default computers OU. So again, we'll talk about that in the next episode. But in this episode, we're gonna look at our users and our groups. In our past episode, I already created one user. It was this guy, Jake is cool. Let's make another one. We're gonna go ahead and create, click new user. This is one way of creating a user. I can just create him from scratch. And this guy's gonna be a nice cool guy, Tom Brady. And if we remember, our naming scheme is Tom Brady, first dot last, at our domain. I'll give him his temporary password, retype it in again, and good security practice, I will user must change password at next logon. This means that when he logs into a domain device, it's gonna prompt him to change his password right away and make his own password that I don't know. Go ahead and click next and finish it up and create him. Okay, let's say just for the sake of our simulation that Tom forgot his password and he needs it reset. If I want to reset Tom's password, I can right click on his user. I can go here and I can click reset password. This will allow me to just go to just that screen and just put in my new password. And again, I can click user must change password at lo next logon. So Tom calls in, I verify it's actually Tom, I reset him. Notice we also have this account lockout status on the domain controller, it's unlocked. If his account was locked out, but he still knew his password, I could just unlock the user's account as opposed to actually resetting it. Again, this stuff is very common that you're gonna be doing at tier one, resetting passwords and looking at this user and account stuff. While we're on the note of users, let's also talk about groups. I'm gonna to go to my groups OU. Note, I don't have any groups. In IT, there are two, I should say, in Active Directory on-premises, there are two main types of groups. I'm gonna right click new, I'm gonna click group. My group name, let's just call this group name IT workers. I'm gonna leave it as global and notice I have group type security or distribution. I'm gonna leave this as security for now. Okay, IT workers. Now I've created a group. If I click on my group, I can double click it and I can click members. Notice how nobody's in this group. Groups are a good way of organizing people. When we're giving people permissions to things, when we're granting people the ability to do certain things, we generally wanna do it with a group as opposed to a user, even if only one user is in the group. Because when you have more users and you become a bigger organization, you're not gonna to wanna to have to put individual users' permissions to different things. It gets messy and it also gets dangerous from a security perspective. You would rather give the group a permission to a certain thing or apply a GPO to the group or give them permission to some certain app or something like that, access, and then you'd rather put people in this group. It's a granular way of controlling access. So let's say Tom Brady is an IT worker. I'm gonna go ahead and click add. I'm gonna type in his name, Tom. And it automatically, when I click enter, I didn't even type anything else. I just clicked Tom, I clicked enter. He's the only Tom in my organization, so it's gonna add him automatically. Tom Brady, I can click apply. I actually don't even have to click apply because if I click okay, it applies. Now when I double click on my group, IT workers, and I go to my members, I can see that I have one member of this group, Tom Brady. Okay, let's go back to our user folder. Let's make a couple more users just for good measure. Let's say I have this guy, Mike Smith, and I wanna make a user with him. Mike Smith is gonna be a member of IT admins. Okay, so he's gonna be a member of that group that are IT workers, I should say, of that group that I just created. 
the easiest way to make a user, especially when you have hundreds of users that have a bunch of different permissions, the easiest way to do it is to find a user that you can copy him from. Normally, I'm not right clicking and creating new users like this, new user. Normally, I'm gonna say, okay, which user can I copy this from? And my internal IT contacts is gonna know or HR is gonna know. Okay, this guy's gonna have the same permissions as Tom Brady. The easiest thing I could do is just right click Tom Brady, copy, and then I can create this new user, Mike Smith, and I'll give him his username, Mike.Smith. I'll go next, I'll give him his password. Okay, once I have his password created, I'll go next and I'll click finish, create my user Mike Smith. If I double click on Mike Smith, I haven't done anything else, and I go to his membership, I go to member of, I can see that Mike Smith is a member of domain users because that's automatic, but he's also a member of IT workers. I didn't manually put him in that group. I just copied Tom Brady, double click on Tom Brady. Tom Brady is a member of IT workers. So Mike Smith is gonna get that same group membership. That's very important. And if I go over to my groups and I double click on the IT group workers group itself, I can see its members and I can see I have Mike Smith and Tom Brady. So that's kind of users and groups. It's something you're gonna be doing very often and we're gonna reference these groups in future episodes when we're doing things like GPO. Okay, so again, Mike Smith calls in, he needs to reset his password, I can right click him and I can reset password and I'll just go ahead and reset it and make him change that at the next logon. Good to go. That's a very common thing that we're gonna see. Jake is cool, calls in and his account is unlocked. I can go here, I could double click on his account actually, not right click it, I can go over to his account and it would show this account is locked out in the domain controller. Of course it's not because Jake is cool doesn't actually exist. I just created him, but I could just click unlock account. Okay, that's gonna unlock his account. Now, of course you do actually have to verify that the account is locked out when someone says they're locked out because sometimes they say they are and it's actually not and it's something else that's going on. Sometimes an account will be disabled. Oftentimes a disabled account is purposeful. It's somebody got fired and maybe they don't know it yet. You know, it's disabled, they call in, they're like, hey, I can't get in. You go in here and you check right down on this menu and it shows account is disabled. Let's go ahead and check that. If you see that, just be wary of it because when somebody calls in and their account is disabled, it may have been done on accident by another help desk tech. It also may have been done on purpose and they got fired and they don't know it yet. Okay, but so you can enable accounts by unchecking this, just be careful with it. Notice how when that account is disabled, I have this icon here as well. I don't know if you could see it. It's right next to my guy. It shows like a weird little icon that it is disabled. If I enable it again and I apply that and click okay, that icon goes away. So now he's enabled again. Jake is cool. Okay, for our experiment, let's say that I have another branch now. I have branch one and branch two. I'm gonna go ahead and click here up on the domain. I'm gonna click new and I'm gonna click organizational unit. Let's make branch two and I'm gonna build out all of the same infrastructure that I did for that other branch. Okay, so now I have my users, computers, and groups in both my branch one and my branch two. Let's say that this user Tom is in branch one, but he actually got moved to branch two. And so now he's gonna have these policies that are applying to him that have to do with branch two, that are linked to branch two. I can just grab Tom and I can move him over to the proper OU that I have to. So Tom's a, currently a user in branch one. I can just grab him, drag him over to branch two. Active Directory is gonna say, wait, make sure you actually wanna do this because he's gonna get different policies and it's gonna affect the way that they're applied to him and stuff like that. We're totally cool with that. We're gonna follow through with it. We're gonna click yes. Tom Brady is now in branch two users OU as opposed to branch one. Now again, why this matters is for mostly for GPO. All right? GPO is group policies. Like say that we have printers that are a policy that are applying to certain branches. Like branch one's gonna get their branch printers, of course. Branch two is gonna get their branch printers. When Tom moves to branch two, if he's still in that branch one OU, his PC or him is still gonna get that branch one printer set, which he wants the ones at his branch, of course. Very common. Okay, so now at this point, we have multiple sub OUs. We have a group that has to do with IT workers. We have people objects in our users objects. We don't have any computers yet because we haven't domain joined anything yet. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look into our people. Let's go to Mike Smith. Notice we have all of these different tabs in Active Directory. We've got a bunch of different stuff. I can add a description to this guy. Let's just say Mike Smith is a network guy. I'm just gonna say network team and description. I can apply this, I can click okay. Notice how his description now appears. Mike Smith, network team. Let's say that Mike Smith has a telephone number. 712-222-2222. I can apply that. This might show up in a signature line if I have some software that actually pulls data from Active Directory and automatically makes signatures, which is super common. So that's important. If I go to my organization and I want certain things to show in teams, like who he reports to. If you work in corporate America, you can see this sometimes. You can see like this hierarchy of organization. I can put his manager. Let's say Jake. Let's say that Jake is cool is his manager. So I'm going to go ahead and go Jake is cool. 
Now that's going to appear in Teams, like if he has Teams, his job title might want that in his signature. He's a network engineer. This guy's got a CCNP. He's way above where I am. Department, I don't know, the networking department. Does that make sense? The company might just be our local NE's company. And again, this isn't super important, but this is like the type of stuff that Microsoft's going to be pulling from as well in order for things like this to show in Teams. We've also got all this other stuff. Telephone numbers, if we want to have that information in there. A profile path. He might have a home folder, and we'll talk about SMB and folder permissions and stuff like that in a future episode. I might have this local path that connects to, I don't know, lab-vm, and then my public users Mike Smith folder, and I'm going to have that connect to his computer automatically, and I might call it some certain thing. So all of this is important stuff. We also have this thing here called attribute editor. Go ahead and apply those changes. Make sure that everything's good. That's totally fine. Attribute editor has a lot going on. I usually like to filter it, and I like to show only writable, sorry, show only attributes that have values here. If I do that, I can see all of these attributes. Very good. Let's say Mike Smith, for whatever reason, changed his last name, and I'm going to go ahead and uncheck this show attributes only that have values. Let's say he changed his last name, and he also wants to be able to send email from this email, Mike Johnson. Or rather, he wants to be able to receive email from this email, Mike Johnson. I can go P here. I can scroll down a little bit, and we have these things called proxy addresses. I can click on proxy addresses, and I can add values for his proxy addresses, right? So his main email is going to be SMTP capital letters, Mike.Smith at lab.local, right? His proxy address that I want to add so that he can receive emails at this other one might be a lowercase smtp, mike.johnson at lab.local. Okay, so now I have this set up. Once this syncs up with Microsoft, he's going to be able to receive email at this mike.johnson at lab.local as well. So that's important as well. Go ahead and apply this. Oh, it's angry about our server thing. Let's go back to our profile and get rid of that. We'll just do local path. And I'm actually going to get rid of that all together because I don't feel like dealing with that right now. So we'll go ahead and click apply. We'll click OK. Now, if I go to Mike Smith, I can see his main email is mike.smith at lab.local. If I go to attribute editor, click on something and type P, and I go down to my proxy addresses, very common thing that you're going to be looking at it, T1, T2, T3, is the capital SMTP from Mike Smith. He can send email as that. He can also receive email as Mike Johnson. Okay, that's important. There's a bunch of other proxy addresses like lapse password, custom attributes, things like that that we use all the time as well, but we don't need to go too deep into the weeds with those right now. I'm going to apply and I'm going to click OK. OK, and if I really wanted to get deep, I could create other groups as well. I could, I have my IT workers group. I might create a HR group, a security group. I can also create this thing called distribution groups, which distribution groups are important. If I go create, distribution groups are important, but I'm going to leave the distribution group side of things to my Microsoft series. Basically, a distribution list is a group of people who, when an email is sent to that list, a copy of that email is sent to all people. So if you're in an organization, say an IT organization, and you have a group that is IT tier one at domain.com, right? And you're a part of that group, and you receive all those emails for IT tier one at domain.com. It might be true that this is a distribution list, and every other tier one is also getting a copy of that email. That's a distribution list. But again, we'll get deeper into that when we go to our Microsoft series. So we have an Active Directory domain controller. We have a domain. We have branches. How we would normally organize branches, computers, groups, and users. This is all really granular. You can organize things in different ways as well. Different companies do things in different ways depending on the size of the company, depending on how big they plan to be, and also just depending on how organized they are. Some companies are extremely unorganized and just have random users and computers all over the place and group policy is a big mess. Of course, we don't want that as a company. We want to be organized, but Sometimes it's ad hoc, just trying to make things work in the moment. But my recommendation for you is that you continue practicing with this stuff. Make more OUs, sub-OUs, groups, users. Look at what you can do with these users. Hop into Attribute Editor and start looking at these different attributes. This is all super important. Important thing, if I actually want to see where a user is too, I can go up here to Object. Lab.local, Branch 1, Users, Mike Smith. And I guess I missed something really important as well. What if you have a million users and someone calls in and you don't know where they're at? You can go up here. You can click on this thing, find objects. When it says find users, contacts, groups, you can change this to the entire directory and then you can find your user. So, you know, Tom calls in. You have no idea where Tom actually is to reset his password. You can type in his name, click on it, double click on him, and you can track down Tom. I hope that makes sense and, and that's clear as well. If I want to know where Tom is actually located, I can go up here to this object tab and it'll show me. 
He's lab.local, branch two, users, Tom Brady. Oh, okay. Lab.local, branch two, users, Tom Brady. Once I double click on him, I have access to that attribute editor as well. So all of this super important stuff, super good stuff to practice with. If you can do this, create users, create groups, copy users, reset passwords, unlock accounts, even look at things like attribute editor, you're going to be cooking for when you go into your tier one job. Again, this is the type of stuff that I would have wanted to be able to do before I was actually a T1. I did it with this guy, KevTech. I love him. I think his lab is amazing, but his lab was hosted on-prem. It was hosted on his computer. I've done all this in Azure. I don't have to use any computer resources. I'm just using my internet connection. So now you've seen what Active Directory actually looks like on the job. This is what you're going to be using every single day as a tier one. In the next episode, we'll spin up a Windows 10 device and actually join it to the domain. This way we can start logging in as users, testing some policies, and doing some more real-life IT tasks. I hope you found this useful. Highly recommend playing around in Azure and in your Windows Server VM. Play around in Active Directory. It's going to be super useful for you to be able to take this information, document it in a GitHub, and be able to show an employer someday, hey, I have actual Active Directory experience doing this and that. One thing that's important not to forget is we're going to go here, we're going to close out of this, and I'm going to remind you guys every single episode, go back to Azure, go home, Search up here in the top in resources, find your resource group, RG, lab test one. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to delete right up here where it says delete resource group. When I delete it, it's going to delete all of those resources. So I'm no longer paying for them. We don't want to pay extra money. So use your lab. Once you're done, delete everything. And then you're going to have to redeploy it the next time you come in. It's a pain in the booty, I know, but it's going to save you a lot of money and you're not going to be spending a ton of money. So I'm done filming for the day. I'm actually going to delete this. I'm going to click apply force delete for selected virtual machines and virtual machine scale sets. I'm going to put in my resource group name, RG lab test one, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click delete. Confirm the deletion. Everything's going to be gonzo, but I'm not going to be paying money anymore. Let's do it. And as that deletes, we should be good to go. Appreciate you guys. Let me know if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, things that I could do better in these videos. Really appreciate all the support you guys have given me so far. Be safe, be smart, Make some good decisions and good luck with those Active Directory labs. See you in the next one.